Good morning. We're about to go downstairs and have breakfast at the hotel before getting the shuttle to the airport. So we just come down for breakfast. It wasn't initially included in our hotel stay, but they just informed us that it's only 90 dirham extra per person. So why not? Based on the buffets, these are the choices we made. So I've got kind of like a half sort of pre-cooked bit and then a little pancake like what we've had previously. And then because I'm a sucker for Madeleine from France, then that's what these are. And then it looks like Rachel's gone for the patisserie special. So she's got a pan au chocolat, croissant, another pancake, and then some what looks like banana bread or something like that. I guess we'll find out complete with orange juice and coffee. So you may have seen like the cereals and stuff like that that were on offer as part of the breakfast buffet. And so if we kind of buy round two, yes, it is a buffet and I am a large person not to eat a lot. But basically with the cereals that were on offer, they're all ones that I recognize from my holidays in France, so one which we would all go on as a kid. And uh, yeah, it's brought back a huge hit of nostalgia. And it, amongst that, have uh, what's called chocolate beef, which is just like a chocolate based cereal. Kind of like imagine kind of a hybrid between like cocoa puffs and like maybe like cornflakes, but it just works and it's delicious. So it's that, croissant, and another coffee. And I thought this was apple juice. It turns out it's actually peach juice. All checked out. Now heading to the apple. Sad face, but uh, we have another what 40 minutes before we actually have to board, so we're just gonna mill about, see if there's anything cool and duty free, and otherwise, just spend some time. But unlike last time where we accidentally went through parking control, we have now just gone through an extra security gate. But despite the fact that we, well, what we didn't quite realize was that despite the fact that we bought one and a half liter bottles each of water that we didn't touch the entire flight here, 
We bought them in duty free. Indeed. Basically, no, like, it all seemed very much above board, but despite that, we were still told that we needed to uh, clear the contents of that and dispose of the bottles. So we opted to get our money's worth by. We just took one and a half liter bottles of water, and now my stomach is a disaster. So is mine. <laughs> but it's important to stay hydrated. So, if anything, we were really living by that. So our gate is probably not going to show for probably the next two and a half hours. So we've got a little bit of time to kill. So we're going to have a look through and see what we can do to keep us occupied in the meantime. So while we were in duty free, I got a little bit of a craving because I was looking at all the chocolate and thinking, well, we're going to go back to North America where maybe it's not quite as good quality or you pay more for it. So. We had a look and we opted to just try some of this stuff, which I've never seen before in my life. So this is dark chocolate with cranberry, raspberry and almond. Sounds amazing. And then on top of that, because I just cannot resist a nice slice at home, we've got a classic dairy milk. Okay, let's give this a go. I know that there are some people who are a bit polarized about having like fruits or nuts in their chocolate, but if you are a fan of this, amazing. So you're probably wondering why I got so gushy about this in particular, especially since technically you can get Cadbury's in Canada. The thing is though, it's not actually done to the same recipe. So this throws in, I think, more milk solids, more cocoa solids, and just makes it a richer flavor. So by comparison, this one, generally speaking, is the better quality, which is why I go quite nuts for it whenever I get the opportunity to have it. So with that, here's to you. sorry that we're looking kind of rough we've just come off of like a however many hour travel day probably like at least 12 hour travel day yeah it's been a really long day capped off by a transatlantic flight where it took us a while to get out of customs so yeah we tried our best it was a wonderful couple of weeks in morocco which we will definitely treasure for a very long time so take care and keep smiling So today's vlog was probably pretty short and boring because it was just a travel day. So now that we're back home, we've decided we will share some of the tips and tricks that we picked up while we were in Morocco. So the first thing is that um, a lot of the sales that take place, especially in the souks, are all based on bartering. It can be a little bit daunting at first because uh, they throw you a specific price and in most instances, in most other countries, you'd be like, yeah, okay, that's the price, but they expect you to haggle with them. So. The main tip that we found is go for sort of about 25 to 30% of whatever they quoted and then try and see if you can meet somewhere in the middle. Generally, if you've got it at about 50% of what was quoted, then you've done well. The other thing you do need to haggle for is taxis and you would never expect this in another country. However, 
it is totally normal to do. They will often start with a price of like 100 dirham. But honestly, if you're going from like the train station to your Riyadh or hotel, you should never really be paying more than 50 dirham at the absolute most. And even that is probably a little much. The cheapest we got a taxi was 15 dirham, believe it or not. And that was three of us. So another good tip is to share a taxi with someone else. I don't think you can expect 15 dirham all the time. I think consistently or like on average, try and pay about 30 dirham. Another thing that we found, uh, which again is a stark contrast to what we're used to, is that the society in Morocco is completely cash based. There are very, very few places where you can actually make use of anything other than cash. So when it comes to hotels or train tickets or things like that, then those are the very few places where you can opt for card. In most instances though, you will have to pay with cash, so make sure that you do bring sufficient amounts of cash with you into the country if you can. However, there are also uh, plenty of ATMs that you can try to use to withdraw more cash, though we did have a couple of issues with that now and then. Try being the operative word. Yes, because certain ones sometimes choose to not accept your card, so just be mindful of that. Can end up being something of a half hour excursion when you were expecting it usually to be about five minutes. So, yeah. yeah, it can Keep test on. your patience, but in the end, we ultimately found a bank that would let us withdraw money in the end. Yes. But sometimes it was a bit of a search. Exactly. In regards to credit cards, you can use them some places, like for example, at the train station. That being said, you cannot book the train online with a foreign credit card, nor can you use your foreign credit card at one of the ticketing machines in the train station. You actually have to go and stand in line and purchase the train ticket from a customer service agent with your foreign credit card. They'll have chip and pin. Alternately, you can also still pay cash, but you do need to interact with a human being. Yes. The great thing is though, once you have got your ticket, then the trains are actually very nice. So they have two classes. So second class is kind of a bit of a free for all. But if you want to have a guaranteed seat in a guaranteed cabin, then the best option is always to go for first class trains. To be honest with you, in terms of the price, there's not a huge amount of difference to pay that little bit extra, but that added bit of comfort is always great. Otherwise, it's always clean. The seats are comfortable. We spent probably the best part of a whole day in total on trains and we had no problem with it whatsoever. It all worked out very nicely. And they run on time too. Yes, they do. Another thing you can use your credit card on often is if you're like booking hotels or riads or tours. However, be aware that if you book one and you've only put a deposit down on card, that a lot of them ask you to pay the balance in cash. So another time where you are going to need to have a substantial amount of money on you. Another thing that we did actually find though is that tour operators expect to have the reservations booked through wherever it is you're staying. So ahead of time as a means of maybe not having the same slip ups that we ended up having, then perhaps the best idea would be to either, one, notify the Riyadh or wherever it is you're staying that you are planning on going on that tour and let them know exactly who it is and when you're planning on going so that they're prepared. Or alternatively, ahead of time, be sure to contact the tour operator to ensure that your place is reserved and that they do know exactly where to pick you up and when. Another thing though is that if there is a mistake with your tour, these companies are so accommodating. Yes. They really aim to satisfy you. You can always contact them via WhatsApp or a telephone and they will go above and beyond to correct the error for you. So even if something goes wrong with collection, because there's been a miscommunication with you, the Riyadh and tour company, they'll fix it, don't worry. Another thing is to do with navigation. You may think, and certainly this is an option that you can do if you get into the airport, they do offer for you to pick up a SIM card with a data plan and all that kind of stuff, that's lovely. And it is pretty cheap. 
but you don't necessarily need that to get around. If you have access to Wi-Fi during your stay, which you probably will if you're staying in most accommodation types, then what you can do is you can do offline maps. So best thing to do is search for wherever it is you're going on Google Maps, and then you leave the directions open, but you don't actually ask for the navigation to start, but you just leave then the data open. What that then does is it allows for Google to track you via GPS, and it means then that there's basically a blue dot on the map that you can see exactly where you are in comparison to the route that's given. That was essentially the best way that we found to get around the problem of maybe not having data all the time. And the Medina is a complex maze, but for the most part, Google Maps is very accurate. Of course, there are some discrepancies, mm. but it was good enough that we were always able to find our way around. Back to Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is readily available. You'll have it in your hotel, your Riyadh. A lot of restaurants offer it. We even had it in the Sahara, which is incredible. It's all solar powered, by the way. It was. That being said, it can be a little bit spotty. I'd say everywhere. Like generally it's better in the big cities, but we did have a Riyadh where our only complaint, because the Riyadh was actually incredible. Mm -hmm. Our only complaint was that the internet at that Riyadh was very temperamental. I think another thing just to bear in mind is that when you do go outside of your accommodation and you don't necessarily have a tour and all that kind of stuff, there are a couple of things that you just need to be aware of because they are somewhat different to what you would be used to in both Europe and also in North America. So while in a lot of instances you may be kind of deemed to be kind of one of those tourists just have, having a map open in front of you, People will pick up on that and they may offer to take you somewhere. While that is all very well intended and you may think, oh, this person is definitely really wanting to help me out, definitely pays to look a gift horse in the mouth here because in certain instances they may end up taking you to where they want to take you rather than the place that you're actually meant to go. But also what may equally happen is that they do actually take you where you ask them to take you, but then they expect some money in return. If it does happen and you know you are in a position whereby you have a map open, you know where you're going and they're offering to help, you can either politely say no thank you or you can feel free to ignore them. So this kind of happened to us when we were in Marrakesh. We were walking to Bahia Palace and according to Google, I think it was open from like 9 a.m. Don't take my word for that, but we... No, it was. I can't confirm. <laughs> <laughs> and we were walking around the outer walls and we encountered this man who was like, oh, I'm not even like a resident here, I'm a student. And he's like, and just so you know, it's not open to tourists until like noon. So why don't you go to the Jewish quarter? It's over here. Yeah. And fortunately we had another place we wanted to visit in mind and we just kept walking along that same route. And don't you know it? we come to the entrance of Bahia Palace and it's open. And this is something that I had heard before we went to Marrakesh actually, that people will kind of try to distract you or throw you off your, your route so that you end up going again where they want you to go. Maybe they're selling something, but another thing to be aware of. Speaking of things just to be mindful of, especially when you're in Marrakesh, then Jamal al Fanar is a pretty impressive place. It has all the market stands that you could possibly hope for with all of the genuine fake goods that you could <laughs> shake a stick at. But do be mindful because you may see some things that you might not have seen before. First one is snake charming. The other one is for trained monkeys. And basically the instant that these people may lock eyes with you, then they will want you to come over. And in some instances, if somebody has a monkey on a lead, then they will get that monkey to basically jump on you. And then to get that monkey back off you, then they will expect payment and it will be an exorbitant sum. So one of the things that we were always very conscious of doing was not making eye contact or very, very hastily dodging the snakes and the baboons. So do be very mindful of that. Equally, there were a lot of henna stands. The people that were there were very charming and everything like that, but they were offering free samples. But then the next thing you know, you would sit down and that free sample would then turn into a full design you just spent hours in the chair and they would have expected payment. So again, 
keep your wits about you. For those who are seasoned, you've probably heard about all of this before and you know to avoid it. But for those who may be trying to visit the country for the first time and haven't really been exposed to this kind of thing in the past, just be mindful of that. Morocco also has something that's called city tax. So when you're staying at a Riyadh or hotel, you'll be expected to pay in cash like at the beginning of your visit or when you're checking out an additional sum of money to what you paid for your stay there as well. It's not a significant amount, but it's just another sum of money that you're gonna need to have on hand. Exactly. City tax is not anything new. When you go to places like New York or wherever else that has a city tax in place, then you do still have to pay that city tax, but typically that's rolled into the price of the hotel. The difference here is that it isn't and it is a supplementary fee that you are expected to pay upon checkout. So if you're trying to save money on food, especially when you're on vacation, I would think going to a supermarket would be a good option and then eating at the hotel or in a park or on a bench would be lovely but there aren't really supermarkets in Morocco. It's still a marketplace system. So you do need to go to a local market if you wanna do it this way, or find something cheap in the Medina. And the great thing is the farther into the Medina you go and kind of away from all the tourist stuff, then there are definitely great options that are possible if you are trying to work on a shoestring budget. You do probably need to shop around quite a bit. So after some time just exploring, then we managed to find huge bottles of water for six dirham every time, and you will need that. Dehydration is real. But equally, you could find the same price for a small espresso. You could also find sandwiches like we did, anything between eight to 25 dirham, which is more than what you need for lunch, typically speaking. So there are definitely cheaper places that are available to you within these market stands, but you just have to know exactly where they are and you have to seek them out. In terms of like, if you want to sit down dinner, I would say that if you stay within the main tourist area and the big squares, you're going to be looking at anywhere between 60 and 100 dirham. However, if you just wander maybe like a couple hundred meters, into the Medina on the side streets, you can find the exact same food anywhere from 25 to 40 dirhams for dinner, for a sit down meal. So something to think about. And we assure you the food between each of those places is just as good and sometimes even better at the cheaper restaurant. So do be mindful of that. Generally one of the main tips that we often go for is if we see locals that are eating there, then that's usually the best sign that it's good food and not aimed at tourists. And when you are wandering through looking for restaurants, expect people to approach you and try and convince you to come to their restaurant. We found that by saying, oh, we've just ate, or maybe later, maybe tomorrow, we'll remember you, kind of just got them to back off instead of following you or keep talking. A couple of other things, so because it is a predominantly Muslim country, then it is very difficult to find booze in Morocco, so it is not a place for a stag do by any stretch of the imagination, and anywhere that does do booze is somewhere that would be very much aimed at tourists, so um, if you are to be cajoled by you know, the offer of a bottle of wine at this very plush looking restaurant, then chances are that you're going to have to pay probably about five times the price of what you would normally pay at a typical restaurant in the Medina. But you know, if you're on the healthier side and you're wanting to get a good health kick, then it's the best thing in the world because not only is there a lack of booze, but also everything that is available in the markets and in the restaurants is made fresh for you that day. So therefore it's a very good place to eat clean actually. Coffees there are mostly like espressos, cappuccinos, lattes, there's no trenta or venti like you would find at Starbucks. <laughs> but it tastes amazing because it's such good quality and it's fresh. Speaking of food and drink, as is probably the best custom in most countries that you will ever visit, there are always signature dishes, there are always things that you will be able to find in that particular part of the world that are unique. So with that, some of our best recommendations would be tagine, of pretty much every variety. Couscous, pastilla, which I ended up having probably about three or four times while I was there. 
it's incredible. And then tea, what they do is basically they take green tea, they add fresh mint to it, and you then have either honey or sugar thrown into it. And that adds a little bit of added sweetness, but it's just delicious. Otherwise, there are chivakia, which are a type of pastry. Very, very nice, covered in honey, but with kind of an almond and sesame coating. Absolutely delicious, can't, can't lord that enough. There's also horn gazelle pastries, which basically look like kind of mini dumplings, like gyoza kind of things, but they are filled with marzipan, or at least something with a marzipan quality, and they are equally lovely. Oh god, the cat's coming in. Hey Dante, what's up? You want to be part of the video? You want to give them some recommendations for Morocco? Say hi. You want to, you want to give them some recommendations? Yeah? You want, you want to say hi? Cool. Sorry, our cat's just going to join us. Exactly. So everybody say hello to Dante, or a part of Dante. Dante's fur. Yes. He's going to frame the video now. Absolutely. If anything, he's going to help us edit it. He's going to take Nick's place, actually. Yeah. Woo! There we go. He's found the camera. Oh, the camera loves him. And he loves the camera. Dante, you do need to move a little bit soon. Yeah, buddy. We love you, but you've got to go. So otherwise, in terms of sweet treats, then they do do orange and cinnamon, literally some powdered cinnamon over the top of some sliced oranges. Very simple, but it works. And then otherwise, they do grow date palms, uh, date palm trees in Morocco, and so dates are a large export that they love to provide. So with that, then the dates that you can get in all parts of Morocco are absolutely divine. And same also with the quality of the almonds that you can get to. <laughs> oh, this cat. Oh, what's he like? We love him. Okay, in terms of the clothing that you want to bring, it's very hot in Morocco, even in their pre-summer as well. So I would suggest loose clothing, whether that be like gaucho pants or a dress. Now, ladies, a dress at your own risk because, I mean, personally, I get a little bit of chub rub, so it's not the most comfortable. Maybe you want to bring shorts for underneath. Also, linen shirts for covering up. Just because it is a predominantly Muslim country, again, you want to make sure that, like, your shoulders are covered, your top's not too low cut, and I think also covering your knees. Not that a linen shirt would help with that, but a linen shirt is nice and light. You can carry it with you and put it on as you need it. Also, for men and women, dry fit clothing would be incredible so that like if you do sweat, you take it off and it dries pretty quickly. Yeah, as someone who does unfortunately sweat a lot, by having dry fit clothing, especially in the desert, then it really helps and definitely helped me stay cool in what otherwise would have been a very dry, arid environment. So yeah, cannot recommend that highly enough. If you have any other tips and tricks for traveling Morocco, then leave them in the comment section below. Also, if you have any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So for now, take care and keep smiling.